Welcome. Thank you for joining us on the second in our webinar series called Managing Career Uncertainty During COVID and Beyond. My name is Jeff Metz of RTD, and I'm your moderator for our conversation today on Retire or Rewire. Can you afford to stop working? Can you pivot to a new career? We'll spend 40 minutes in a dialogue with our two panelists, Rob Croner, Vice President of Senior Executive Services at CCI Consulting, and Bill Love, Senior Financial Planner, who leads retirement counseling for RTD. Why are we talking about managing career uncertainty? Well, managing careers fits into RTD's life-centered planning focus. RTD is a financial advisory firm that counsels individuals, retirement plan trustees, and trust fiduciaries in life-centered decisions of financial planning, investment management, and fiduciary obligations to others. And at RTD, we know career is central to our clients' lives, their financial futures, and their identity. We often provide planning guidance to a one or two career couple where an employment opportunity is no longer meeting their family work-life balance or career aspirations, and we assist analyzing the outcomes of various alternatives they might consider. Or often we get questions of how much of a financial cushion is there to re-educate and pivot to a late career pursuit. But what's before us now? In the past year, the disruption of COVID-19 worldwide has introduced a whole new rethink about how business is done, accelerating the ongoing digital transformation of many industries. And thanks to RTD's prior work experience with CCI, we've learned that career management is not something you put on the shelf and remove when you might need it. Career management is an exercise you want to build on regularly. So we believe it's critical for anyone in mid or late career to stay in front of this and strengthen your ability to pivot and take advantage of opportunities. And if presented with an opportunity to leave the workforce, what do you need to do to prepare mentally, socially, and financially? So we will talk about what you should have in place before making the decision to retire. We'll talk about what you should have in place to transition and successfully retire. And we'll talk about what you need to know to rewire. So, can you afford to retire? As financial advisors, our experience at RTD is that people will seek out a financial advisor when in transition, anticipating a transition, or the stakes are higher. So, if you are 10 years or so from what you thought was your retirement date and face a possible job loss, you've experienced two of the three reasons to start thinking about your financial position. So, Bill, what should someone do to get in touch with their own financial reality? Yeah, thanks, Jeff, and uh, welcome, everybody. Um, I, you know, I think that they should ask themselves these two questions. They should get very clear on, on where they currently stand and where do they want to go. And when I say you know, where, do, where do you currently stand is to, to take an inventory on their, their expenses and what is it that they live on on a monthly basis. I find that that's a, a very good exercise for anyone to go through. It, it empowers you. You know where your money's going, and you know how to start planning for the future. In addition to the regular monthly, what we refer to as core expenses, also uh, take a look at your discretionary spending. You know how many trips do you want to take? Um, gifts, gifting to the families, and you know home renovations are, are, are some examples of that. Second thing is to um, take a look at your income sources to support those expenses. Um, you know, some some of you may have pensions out there. What are the payouts? Or or your spouse has a pension. Uh, Social Security planning. What are the what are the payouts at age 62, full retirement age, and uh, at age 70? And then what 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 about your portfolio? You know how is that allocated? That this is this is the savings that is going to replace that paycheck. So it's important to take inventory of all those sources. In addition, you may have some extra ones that you know maybe a small business on the side or some rental income. Get a lay of the land of what your expenses and income look like, and then you can move on to to the next step, which is, which would be where do I want to go from here? Now, what are the goals? What's the timing that you want to do? Or plan it out, whether it's retirement or pivoting to that new career or you know new job that you're looking at. And how prepared is your family? Um, you know, we, we've we've gone through some of the, some uh, practice run with COVID, unfortunately, that to be home together. 
how is that going? Um, you know, what what's the preparedness for, you know, uh, your spouse and, and anybody else in your household? Housing, that's another thing. You know, how long do you intend on staying in the house? And a lot of a lot of clients we see are still in their homes that they raised their family in for 40 years. And that gets to a point where it's at some point it gets overwhelming to try to figure out how to start uh, transitioning now that home. Leisure, uh, you know, that's the fun part of retirement. That's, you know, that's where, you know, what am I going to do? I'm going to travel, golf, um, you know, all the things that you dreamed of that when you were too busy working, you couldn't do. And health, health, you know, how is your health? Health and health and wealth are very connected. Um, you know, making sure that when you're you're going into this phase that you are mindful of where your health is and, and, and what, you know, how's that connected to your financial planning? And uh, but what would an advisor want to know if asked to make a financial assessment of whether someone can afford to retire? And so that you know, this is what we call the you know the next step. Right? While working, you're you're mostly contributing to, to the accumulation. So you know, if you're if you're suddenly uh, doing distribution planning, and you know, how do you make that switch? Um, you know, it's it's we've all been taught to save, and we're suddenly doing distribution planning. Um, you know, what, what do we do to make sure that our money lasts longer than we do, right? So here's some considerations. One, you know, do a risk assessment of your portfolio. Mix that, that you're there, you know, the mix between stocks and bonds um, may not be the appropriate risk um, in retirement or making this change, you know, to, an, to another career. Uh, you know, what's your risk tolerance and capacity to take on risk? The markets get volatile. How, how do you feel about that when you're, you're you're no longer working or starting a new chapter in your life? Determine how much cash reserves you have or need to sleep at night. This is a big one. This is this goes back to the getting the inventory of your overall expenses and uh, making sure where you stand. So how many how many years of worth of expenses do you you feel that you need to to ride out some of that volatility that occurs a long way. Next step would be determine your tax situation and get a sense of what bucket to draw from. There's three different buckets that we look at with, with regards to where do you take that money from a tax efficiency efficiency standpoint, whether it be your taxable income, taxable money, tax deferred, which is your 401k and your IRAs. Or tax-free, which is your Roth IRA. Then, you know, lastly is determine, you know, when do you make those changes in the portfolio as far as uh, making sure you're in line with the appropriate target. Wow. So this is just getting ready to make the switch. What should someone think about to sustain the assets for what could be 30 plus years? Right. Uh, yeah, that's that's a great question. Um, you know, you, you work so hard, you know, how do you protect this nest egg you know, that, that the blood, sweat, and tears went into? And, you know, there's two things. One is being aware of what the possible catastrophic risks are. You know, and, you know, these risks such as health event, you know, how, how you know, how are you insured to, to make sure that, you know, if God forbid you get sick, you know, that, that is properly insured. What type of coverage do you need that, that's best suited for your needs? Um, you know, and how do you structure it? Whether it be that private insurance, group for, from the spousal, um, you know, COBRA or Medicare. You know, it all depends on what stage of life you're in. Next would be uh, you know, a long-term care event that is um, you know, where you, you can no longer do or, or having difficulty doing the daily activities of living. And the average stay in, in a nursing home, you know, in New Jersey, is between two two hundred and sixty dollars and four hundred fifty dollars a day. So that's that's that could be you know a big strain on your assets if you're not properly insured. And lastly, is liability, you know, getting sued. You know, very litigious society that we live in. You want to make sure that your assets are properly insured with your property and casualty, as well as if you sit on any boards or, or any any type of profession that would have risk. Second thing is, and this is most important, is find a partner that will help you assemble and quarterback a team of professionals 
this phase of life, such as, you know, a CPA, an insurance broker, an estate planning attorney, a career slash life coach. Um, you know, this, this, is, this is important to bring order to your financial life, to have somebody to help you follow through on your commitments bring insights you know, to make sure that you avoid any emotionally driven decisions when the markets get real volatile, it you know, gets very emotional and anticipate any life, life transitions um, you know, and have that specific knowledge of that whole retirement income planning. Very important to help you, you know, achieve that best life possible. Yeah, and so just to recap, yeah, just to recap, Jeff, is that, you know, you know first, First step, where do you stand? Second step is where do you want to go? Third step is how to get there and how to sustain it. And for many service industry professionals, healthcare or business executives, their personal identity is directly related to their career. So you look at the areas of one's life, whether it be their professional growth, their friends, their community activities, their charitable associations, even their leisure, much of it relates directly to the professional pursuits. So how can someone retire and avoid introducing themselves as the person they used to be? Hmm, great question. Uh, yeah, this, this would be the last step. Uh, what I call this, 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 who are you going to be in retirement? Right? And so instead of thinking of what you're going to do, uh, ask yourself, who am I going to be in relation to? You know, your time. What are you going to do to fill up 40 to 60 to 70 hours a week that you used to you know, fill up with work, family. We talked a little bit about that, you know, a couple couple uh, minutes ago with regards to how prepared are they for this transition. Social life. A lot of us gather, you know, gather at work, and you know, um, not not this year, but you know, in many years past, we have coffee, lunches, dinners, different events with clients. Um, you know, that's that's a that's a big void that. You know, some people have to figure out well, what they're going to do socially. And career, you know, we, you know, if 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 if, if you're rewiring to something else, what is that specific? There's a lot of planning to, you know, at this stage of, of somebody's life, there's a lot of planning to go from one career to another, or one job to another. And so, you know, I suggest working with a career coach or a life coach that. I'll help you paint that picture, and the clearer it becomes with any of this, the more effective the plan is. A great segue to Rob, because um, one of my questions would be, what, what can someone do to inventory the support systems that Bill mentioned, the, the ones they have now, and what will be lost if leaving their profession? Yeah, thank you, Jeff, and good morning, everyone. I'm glad to be here as well, and we appreciate your time this morning. I think, Jeff, in response to that, you know, we all, uh, people who work for companies, I think we all take for granted the various types of support systems and structures that are available to us. We don't really even think about that that much, you know, your IT or technolo technology department and so forth. So I think uh, what I would suggest is that, you know, behooves all of us to really give some thought to what are the different support systems out there or take inventory of those. So some examples, you know, on the financial side, just as Bill was saying, I mean, do do you have a financial advisor or do you have access to some financial advising support? You know, from the career perspective, it may seem, you know, a little trivial, but you know, do you have somebody who can help you with a resume? Uh, how do you create a resume or create a LinkedIn profile and those types of things? Um, you know, on the, the physical or the health side, do you have a primary care physician? Do you have, are you well tended to in terms of just your knowing that you've got a, a health care provider from that standpoint? Um, the emotional well-being is an important part of this whole transition we're talking about. And so do you have a good support system? Do you have friends, colleagues that you can turn to from a support standpoint and you know, get guidance and, 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 and get reassurance and so forth? And, you know, technology, uh, the, the, the pace of technology change is, is rapid and it seems like the, you master one application and there's a next one on your, your cell phone or your mobile phone. And so how do you keep pace with those things? So there's a lot of things out there that before you make this transition or as you're thinking about this transition, again, sort of take that inventory of the different support structures that you may need and how do you create those systems when you're not part of a company going forward. No. Thank you. And, and what have you seen where, you know, these career individuals have successfully transitioned out their retirement, your observations? 
Yeah, what I've seen, Jeff, um, you know, people who have successfully transitioned to this new way of living, whether you want to call it retirement or an encore career or what have you, they found a way to really integrate three things. One is meaningful work, uh, the second is community, and the third is structure. Let me just kind of talk a bit about the three of those. So you know, what I see happen often, um, not always, but, but certainly a lot, or people will develop what I consider this portfolio approach, and no pun intended on a financial portfolio, but this portfolio approach where they sort of cobble together a couple of different facets of things that are of interest to them. It might be part-time work, it might be volunteer work, it might be travel, it might be returning to schools, things that they really have a desire for to pursue and again, creates meaning for them. Uh, so that's the, 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 the meaningful piece about it. Uh, the community is they look for ways to affiliate it. Maybe they share some communal office space. Uh, maybe they create a consulting team and they're part of a project team, those types of things. And the structure, and, and, and Bill alluded to this a bit earlier, you know, he said, how do you replace that 40 to 60 hours that you're working? You know, work structure our day, whether we like it or not, you know, we, if you have an eight o'clock meeting, you know, you've got to be there at that eight o'clock meeting. So it creates that structure for you. So People who have successfully transitioned think about, well, how will I structure my time? What will that look like? Uh, how will I create this new routine or regimen? And those are the things that I really think you should pay attention to. What will be meaningful to me? How will I create this sense of community? How will I affiliate with others? And how will I create structure so that I have a routine that I'm going through day to day? Yeah, and, and the, the concept of you know benchmarking that, that freedom, that idea that uh, Professor Herminia Vera introduced, uh, Harvard and Einstein University is the idea that you know if you have the time to prepare for the transition, you should start sort of scheduling that that time now and, and get ahead of it. Uh, any any other thoughts on on that, Rob? Yeah, Jeff, it, it's uh, I'm probably going to repeat myself too often during uh, this session this morning, but this whole concept of identity uh, and the Professor Ibera uh, coined a phrase called working identity, which really when we are in a professional role, whatever it may be, <clears throat> we all experience this. It, it really creates this sense of identity. When you go to a party, a social function, people say, you know, what do you do? You talk immediately about uh, the work that you do. You talk about, well, who are you? Well, I am a you know, vice president for a company X kind of an idea. So that whole concept of identity is a theme that runs through all of this. So what Professor Iberi talks about, and I think what is so important here, is this idea of knowing and assessing yourself. And I think a huge part of this rewiring is creating, I'm not going to say a new identity, but creating a different way to think about who you are. And if you are no longer a financial planner, if you're no longer a human resources executive, you're no longer a marketing executive or a salesperson, what is your new identity? So knowing and assessing yourself, uh, creating, th thinking about different options that you could become, this new sense of identity and purpose, going back to this idea of meaningful work. And then a key piece of what uh, Professor Ibera talked about, and I think what I would talk about to anyone who's really rewiring is this whole idea of experimentation, you know, dipping your foot in the pool, uh, trying different things, figuring out what I like, what interests me. And, and the whole idea of experimentation is learning from that. Some things you'll like, some things you won't. You know, I'm a big believer that there's no such thing as a failed experiment. It's a learning opportunity. You've now learned you don't like something and you move on to the next thing. So this whole idea of recreating or rewiring your identity and trying different ways to do that is a big piece of the puzzle as people think about this rewiring topic. Yeah, um, that, that's a great point. And um, you know, it sort of, sort of ties into the mental health and, and the physical health and, and how they play in, in the whole retirement decision, right? Yeah, it does. And I, I know, you know, we've talked, uh, Jeff and Bill, about this before. I, I, I think about retirement as this, I use a, maybe it's a silly analogy, this three-legged stool idea. But, you know, one leg of the stool, what you gentlemen are involved in is the financial leg. You know, do I have enough to retire? Can I afford to retire? A second leg of the stool is sort of your, am I, is, is health. Am I going to be well enough to retire? Am I healthy? And it goes back to what we were saying a few minutes ago about taking care of yourself. But the third piece of it, again, is this whole idea of identity. And that really wraps up into this sense of wellness and well-being, this idea of who am I going to be in retirement? And again, I, I go back to what Bill said a few minutes ago. You have a lot of time now on your hands that used to be structured for you. And that time also, when you were working, drove your identity. How will you rewire yourself to say, what's my new identity? So that physical and mental or emotional side of the equation, uh, Jeff, is to me vitally important. Can I afford to retire? 
Am I physically healthy, but also am I emotionally well and healthy? And can I really create a new sense of purpose in retirement? That's a huge part of this rewiring topic that I think people really need to spend some time thinking about. Yeah, yeah. The self worth is really important, and and yeah. one of the you know one of the trends is you know if it is a sudden job loss, you know what steps should someone take to preserve their self worth and their mental health? Yeah, that's a great question, and unfortunately in today's world that that just happens you know too frequently where people are just really um, very unexpectedly impacted by a sudden job loss, as you're saying, and it, it just it's it's such a disruptive event. So a couple. I, I think suggestions I would offer to someone in that, those circumstances. One, and it may sound a little, um, maybe even silly, but the idea of, you know, you're, you, you start to question your value and your sense of worth when that happens to you. So really, I would suggest people, you know, go talk to some of your professional friends or colleagues or friends and family, and not about so much about what happened, but talk about what they value in you. And what you'll get back from them, I'm sure, will be responses around, just your worth as a person, your value, all the things that you do outside of your job that also provide value. So that it, you'll find that I think people find that to be just really affirming about who they are as a person that they as a person and they really do have some worth. I think a second suggestion I would make is that you'll go back and take some time and just kind of review some of your past performance, whether you want to pull out some old performance reviews or uh, different projects that you completed. And I suggest that because when you remind yourself of, of when you've been successful in the past, you remind yourself that, hey, I've done it before, I will do that again. And you again, create this sense of, of sort of value um, that, that goes beyond just the fact that, you're, that, that, that your job has been lost. I think a really important uh, step is um, think a lot about your transferable skills. Um, I'm being a little bit simplistic here, but 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 any job really comes down to sort of two sets of skills. One of the, the what I would call the the technical or the or the job specific skills. What do I need to know to be a financial planner, if you will? But the other set of skills are transferable, and they're much more. People sometimes refer to them, <clears throat> pardon me, as the softer skills. You know, things like interpersonal skills, relationship skills, customer service skills. Take an inventory of your transferable skills because that set of skills, those transferable skills, will be hugely important to you to help you this transition to to the next thing. And then I think coming off of that, it just spend some time brainstorming. You know, what could I do next? What interests me? What type of possible job opportunities might be out there? And begin to think creatively about what could I do? How might these transferable skills translate into a different type of a job opportunity? And then the last thing I would say is you know, just self-care. Um, take care of yourself, uh, however you may do that, taking a walk, reading a book, uh, whatever it may be, meditation, if you will. But the idea of uh, self-care is vitally important. So when your life is disrupted uh, and it's, it's, you're, 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 you're impacted by that, again, self-care, doing your inventory, assessing what your skills, what you're good at, remind yourself of your value. Those are all things that I would really would suggest that people do when they have that sudden disruption in their life. Yeah, and, and uh, you know, the, just the, the whole idea of uh, not having a job or even the word retirement brings up a, a emotionality, you know, it's a very strong emotionality. And many times it's a question of, you know, who am I going to be now? Yeah, and, and you know, what... Um... There's a couple of things that I, I, I would, I guess, suggest or, or offer to people from that perspective, Jeff. And one is to remind yourself that you've gone through, we've all gone through a number of changes over the course of life, you know, whether you want to call them life phases or, some, or, or, or not. But think about things like, hey, when I went to college for the first time, that was a huge change in my life. When I got a promotion and became a, a manager for the first time, that was a big promotion in my life. And if, if you reflect on those I think you'll find that um, we all enter those those change periods with a mix of emotions. We're excited about it, we're nervous about it, we're, we're sort of unsure what will happen next. And we go through this process of change as you do it. And ultimately you look back and you say, wow, I, I did that successfully. I, I became a successful manager. I was able to transition in, into college. I was able to transition out of college and in, in, into my professional life. So we've experienced these periods of change before and the, the concept of, or a phrase called liminality, which is this whole process one goes through when they're experiencing change. So part of my suggestion is just remember you've done it before. You've been successful, you've gone through some other life events and you've come out, if you will, on the other side 
and you've managed it and you've come out and frankly you come out stronger from that perspective um and the other thing i think i would comment on and i'm kind of going back to something i said earlier but jobs provide sort of three things i mean i'm being again somewhat generic here but but at a real core level one one aspect of a job is it provides us a sense of competence a sense of mastery we're, we're good at something we're a good financial planner uh we're a good accountant you know we're, we're a good car mechanic whatever it may be a second thing is that jobs provide us a sense of community a sense of belonging a sense of affiliation and then the third piece is that jobs provide a sense of meaning or purpose so when you move back from the job and you think about those three things that sense of you know what am i competent at uh, how do I affiliate and, and, and become part of a group? Uh, and how do I find a sense of purpose? That's really what I would encourage people to be thinking about in this whole idea of rewiring. Um, you know, if you're no longer an accountant, that doesn't mean, there. It, it, what it means is that you can now find a different way to create a sense of competency or to create a new sense of affiliation or a new sense of purpose. And I think that's the real um, secret to this, you know, if I would say successful rewiring, it, it's not, I'm not saying it's necessarily easy to do, but it can be done. And think about how you approach that sense of how do we become competent in something new? How and where do I want to affiliate? How do I create a new sense of purpose? Those are the things that I would really suggest people spend some time thinking about. Yeah. And even, you know, even maybe some of the activities that provide meaning to them before, they should explore and see what other meaningful activities, you know, are, are and maybe, uh, uh, going to be helpful for them you know, going forward. Yeah, um, you know, uh, I, I come from a human resources background, so I'm always talking about informational, you know, in, interviewing and networking stuff. But I would say that um, when people are pursuing this idea of rewiring and you're thinking about, you know, what might be a next step for me, um, the idea of networking, or I sometimes refer to it as, as informational interviewing, is a great tool to use. And that's simply the idea of if you had, as you think about identifying new interests, um, let's say you want to volunteer your time using that as an example. Well, can you think of two or three or four colleagues that are uh, active volunteers? And I guess my guess is you probably can. Well, then go, hey, have a cup of coffee with them, have a networking session with them. Hey, I'm thinking more about volunteering. Can I talk to you about that? You know, how did you get involved in it? Why did you pick this particular volunteer organization? You know, what, what do you like about it? How's it going for you? that type of a of an informational conversation is hugely valuable to people uh, to help you explore new opportunities and and it's you know the way of going out and sort of creating a sense of learning and experimentation I, I mentioned a few minutes ago and that is i guess the second point i would make um jeff is this idea that um again in my view there's no such thing as a failed experiment if you try something new and you don't like it well now you know you don't like that and so you can take that off the list you don't have to worry about it anymore let me go try something. Let me go try the next thing. So I think a big part of rewiring is this, this sense of experimentation, the sense of trying things. Um, you know, in the ideal world where we have some time to do it, we're thinking a couple of years ahead before retirement, and you use that time to think about, well, let me experiment. Let me try a volunteering activity before I retire and see if I like it kind of an idea. But even those folks who are, as you said earlier, Jeff, are impacted by a sudden job loss, you can use that time that you now have to start to do some experimentation. Um, so those are just two things I would really encourage people to think about that. Let me identify some folks who are doing something that I have an interest in. Let me talk with them. Let me learn from them. Let me try some things differently. And I'll like some and I won't like some. And all of that is a great learning process as they go forward. Yeah, it's a terrific idea. Um, and and we you know, we'd heard from your colleague Lori Plan at our last uh, webinar that you know bridge jobs are much harder to find now. And uh, has anything changed, uh, or is it still the same? Yeah, not not fundamentally. Things really haven't changed that much. It's it's um, I think it's a great thing to consider. So by definition, a bridge job is that they're temporary in nature. They're designed to no pun to bridge a person from you know, sort of one situation and into another situation. So this idea of how do I bridge from job A to job B, if you will. And I think people can appreciate that, that bridge jobs, they're, they're easier to do, I guess, more common, maybe early in your career or uh, where you have, you know, you're, you're bridging from one temporary role to another kind of an idea. But the concept of a bridge job is, a, I think, a great one, Jeff, to, 
to keep in this topic of rewiring in the sense of, I would encourage people to think about and talk to the organizations. There are many organizations that are starting to think about ways to help bridge people you know, into a late stage career or into retirement. So things like a phased retirement program, there are some organizations that offer, hey, we'll phase you from a five day week to a four to a three kind of an idea over time. Um, you, there may be options for people to consider more flexibility and schedule. So can I have a hybrid schedule, which we're hearing a lot about today, where I'm working three days a week in the office and two days remotely and that those remote days give me some more flexible time and so forth. Maybe an idea of going part-time from full-time to part-time. So my point is the concept of bridging is a great one in terms of this whole topic of transition and rewiring. And I really would encourage people to explore even if there's not something formal in where you're working, there may be some opportunities to create full-time to part-time, a phased approach. Uh, maybe there's some flexible scheduling that you could get. So I do think there are ways that people can pursue this sort of bridging concept that, that would be helpful to them. Yeah, and you know, speaking with um, uh, people in the finance industry, you know, with reductions in workforce that companies are contemplating, you know, one of the Questions would be: Is it is it fair to say for someone who's part of the revenue stream, they're going to be more attractive for rewiring than someone who is part of the overhead cost? Yeah, I, it's a great question to to ask, Jeff. And and generally speaking, I would say yes. I mean, if you're in the revenue side and you're contributing to the revenue, odds are the company's going to be more likely to be amenable to some things with you. But but even having said that, you know, I think. There are some caveats to that. I think even if you're on, if you will, the cost side of the organization, but if you have a particular set of skills or expertise, or if you've been with the company for some time, you've just developed this, this great set of institutional knowledge, that's valuable. And so again, I think in that context, you people, I would encourage them to approach the organization about, hey, is there an opportunity to again, rewire what I do and so that we don't you don't lose my expertise, but could we do it in a reduced fashion or that type of idea? So. I do think that there's opportunity for people on the cost side of the equation of the, of the operation to at least pursue um, this rewiring. And I think they'll find that again, organizations may be, um, you know, may be open to that more, more than they might expect as uh, before they, they, they try to have that conversation. Yeah, and, and probably makes sense to inventory whatever your strengths have, you, you have in that area uh, to get ready to take on a new challenge. Yeah, definitely. And um, I mean, there's, um, actually many different types of online skill assessments or inventories that, you know, people could take access to some or, you know, cost money, but m many do not. They're, they're free and they're, they're available on, on the, uh, on the net. Um, I'll go back to something I said earlier, which is this idea that again, sort of broadly speaking, jobs have this set of sort of core technical skills and then transferable skills. And I, again, I would really, in this idea of inventory, Jeff, um, it's important that people think about both sets of skills. You know, what are the things that make me a good accountant in terms of my technical knowledge, but also what are the things that make me a good accountant in terms of my my client facing skills, my my customer service skills, my my you know, uh, organization skills, and so forth. So, you know, that inventory of both technical or specific, as well as you know, the in my mind, the even more important transferable skills or soft skills. It's vitally important that the people do that inventory that they be really kind of clear-eyed about, you know, what are my strengths, where, where are things that I'm good at, where might be some gaps that I know that I have to fill in. So that inventory is a big piece of this whole rewiring or transition process. Yeah, and a lot of times when we counsel clients, we find that they're experiencing a loss of satisfaction in their current position, and we have to encourage them to look for ways to, to find satisfaction. So, you know, in your experience, what are some ways someone can rewire or reinvent themselves at their current work position? Yeah, that's a, again another great question, and um, I'll preface it by saying that you know, again, given my own background and working in the human resources field, that talent, good talent in an organization, is a valuable commodity. So any organization is going to be really interested in trying to retain good talent. So I'm saying that as a preface. Uh, Jeff, to say that, you know, there may be more flexibility than a person might expect uh, because organizations are just fundamentally, they want to keep good people. They want to keep that talent in place, if you will. So with that being said, and obviously every organization, organization is different, 
I do think there are a couple things that 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 they can do that to sort of explore ways of reconfiguring their current role to create some more satisfaction. Um, you know, again, I'll go back to this idea of transferable skills. And even with you're within your same company, you know, what are your transferable skill sets? And are there other roles in your organization where you can see that your skills might be adaptable? You know, maybe you want to move out of uh, a marketing role and into some kind of a customer service or support role, that type of an idea. So those those types of internal movements certainly can happen. Um, a lot of companies, or increasingly, I should say it this way, companies are creating ad hoc project-based teams. You know, a new issue comes up, they create a work team to address this issue. The issue is addressed, that work team sort of disbands. So I would encourage people to keep an eye out for just that kind of an idea. Are there work teams or, or project teams or, or new assignments that may be temporary in nature that they could sign up for? Gives them some additional exposure, gives them an, a different perspective, new skill sets, might be a stepping stone to something else down the road. Um, I think this idea of um small steps and experiments uh the, the 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 idea if you identify a role that you're looking for maybe you can shadow do a job shadow with that role again every organization is a little bit different and then the the last thing i would say is that think about creating your own sort of career management plan create some milestones around that and hold yourself accountable to those milestones sort of say hey in the first six months i'm going to reach out and have three internal networking conversations and all of that to say, Jeff, is that I think there are opportunities for people to reconfigure their work to create some new experiences for them that ideally would be more satisfying and again may lead down the road to something that would be a little bit more positive for them. Yeah. And it's a it's a great idea to whether you're you're new in your career or a lot of experience in your career is to is to document and articulate, you know, what you have in terms of career capital. Um, yeah. Any suggestions there? Uh, career capital. I, I love that phrase because it's just such a nice. Um, it sort of captures the, the 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 essence of a person, and you know, it, it typically career capital is referred to as sort of the the value of a person's competencies, their knowledge, and and, and just their individual presence. Their their you know what they can contribute to an organization, and it's what they use to produce value. So all of us have career capital. You know, we all have a set of experiences. We all have a set of capabilities that we've developed over time and you know, we have a, a, a presence that we bring to an organization so you know thinking about what is your career capital is a great exercise to go through it, it's consistent with what we've been talking about this idea of you know clearly identifying inventorying your skills and so forth and, and one i guess comment i would add or one maybe framework to keep in mind as people think about well how do i increase my career capital is um what I have seen and referred to as the 70-20-10 rule, which is simply stated means that about 70% of our learnings come from actual job experiences. So the more you can create new experiences for yourself in a in an organization or in, in a setting, you learn from that. You know, the 20% the comes from your informal co you know, professional network. The 10% is academic learning. So a lot of folks think about, I'm going to go back to school and that's going to get me to my next job. Well, the reality is your best learnings come from your own experiences um, and from your networking colleagues. So it really reinforces this idea of inventorying your skills, this idea of networking, creating a sense of support structures and colleagues. That's how you tap into this learnings and that's how you create and sort of advance your career capital. And so, you know, with a lot of the shifting going on, the digital transformation, um, you know, whether firms flatten their their management structure or not. Um, what's your observation about industries that appreciate experienced senior leaders and managers? Yeah, I, um, I actually think, Jeff, I'm pretty optimistic about the fact that I think there are multiple industries that do appreciate experienced, I'll just say experienced individuals, whether they're at a, a, a management or, or even a non-management role. And I say that because there's there's data, evidence out there that that, that really points out that over the course of anyone's career, they're acquiring through the experiences, again, a set of skills and competencies. And, and um, there's, again, data that would show that people who are later stage careers, a phrase that I use, you know, really clearly have developed uh, well-developed sets of competencies, particularly, again, on the, the soft skills, the, the, the service orientation, the customer connection, the relationship management, those types of things. So. Stepping back from that, when I say multiple industries, 
you know, in today's world, uh, increasingly we're shifting into much more of a service-based economy. We're shifting to digitization. We're seeing all those things happening. It puts a huge premium on two things from my perspective. One is uh, what I'll call the STEM skills, the sort of sense of science and technology and engineering and math, which are more the technical bucket that we've been talking about. And then the other one is this really set of service skills, this orientation toward people management, uh, people relations, customer service, service support. So again, I think when you are talking about where might my skill sets be valuable, multiple industries in today's world are looking for those two sets of core skills, you know, the, 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 the technical side and the transferable or the service oriented side. And I think the gap that people, I think two things, I think the gap that people often have to fill is on the technical side. So you need to think about if I'm considering a transition to a new industry or a new type of work, what are the technical aspects of that that I need to fill and how might I do that? Is there a certification program I can go to and so forth? I also think that people tend to undervalue or underestimate the sets of skills they already have on the transferable side. There are huge accumulation of experience in terms of interacting with teams, with colleagues, with customers, and that's really, really transferable. So that's why I say, Jeff, I think there's a lot of different industries out there that would want to tap into people who have those strong skill sets of customer orientation. And then people can think about what well, if I've already got that skill set, how do I fill the gap of technical knowledge? And there are different ways that they go about doing that. Yeah. And, you know, in your experience, Rob, in, in terms of the, the profile of someone who is able to successfully rewire, is there anything that sort of jumps out at you? Anything that you could articulate someone that has successfully rewired and transitioned to another career, another skill set? Yeah, I, <clears throat> I'm probably going to be at the risk of repeating myself a little bit, but I, I again, to me, Jeff, two things stand out. Uh, one is um, I, I think it's incredibly important that people do <clears throat> this inventory of the, a skills inventory themselves, and and again, looking at it from both the technical side and uh, I keep saying the transferable or the soft skill side, and I would pay particular attention to that that transferable skill set side because that's a piece of the puzzle that's going to really help them create a broader set of opportunities because again, those transferable skills will play in multiple environments. I think on the technical side, you know, stepping away from the, the, the specific, as I said a minute ago, sort of science and technology, those types of things. I think with people, those who successfully rewire have thought ahead and said, okay, I'm thinking that my retirement is three years off, is five years off, whatever it may be. And, and they've thought, okay, I know I'm going to stop doing, I'm, I'm going to no longer be an accountant. I'm thinking about re, rewiring to something else. What are the technical things or the job specific things that I need to know? So if I use a silly example. Somebody said, I, you know, I, I really like working with people. I, I think I might like to do a human resource kind of work. I would say, well, you know what? There's, there are great HR certification programs out there, three months, six months go invest some time in a certification program to learn the technical side of the work, if you will. And I think multiple professionals have those same examples of things that are technically required or specific to the work that they do. And if people do some planning ahead and construct a skill up on the technical side, they'll have the right combination of, I now, I now have some job specific knowledge and I've got a set of transferable skills that are really powerful to me. So I think a key piece of the rewiring is this sense of, can I have some time to plan and prepare for it and use it time wisely to do just that. Yeah. And, you know, I, I wonder with all the emphasis on the technical skills, uh, do you find that organizations uh, somehow assess their relationship skills that someone has if they're considering, you know, as a, as a rewire uh, coming into the organization? Yeah, um, I go back to what I said a minute ago that organizations really value talent and increasingly in today's organizational world, it's very fluid, it's rapid pace. Um, I've talked about ad hoc teams forming. The point of all that is that organizations put great value on team-based skills, on collaborative skills, um, on resiliency, on the ability to be flexible uh, and change friendly, if you will. So I think what I would focus on or what organizations focus on is how can they leverage the institutional knowledge that somebody has in a world that is rapidly changing and you do that organizations do that by becoming very flexible with how they think about their workforce 
talent management and how they allocate the resources in an organization. So that was an HR jargoning way of saying that if you're an individual in an organization, bear in mind that organizations value talent, they want flexibility, they want to be able to allocate the talent quickly as they need to to different work projects come up. So keep your eyes open for, again, new assignments, temporary assignments, flexible assignments, the things that will create exposure and opportunity for you. Um, that's the bridge, to go back to what we talked about before, that's the bridge into a new opportunity. And organizations really do value those relationships and those skill sets. They would rather, let me put it this way, Jeff, it's easier for an organization to repurpose and reallocate and reskill somebody, a talent they already have that is familiar with their culture, their norms, their ways of working, than to go find a new talent and onboard that talent and in, in, in bring that talent up the learning curve. It works for organizations financially and from a productivity standpoint to reinvest in their existing people. So it's a great combination. Organizations need to reinvest in talent. Um, they sometimes will divest in talent. We know that. But if you're an individual, actually there's a there's a in my mind a greater openness or receptivity to organizations being open to new assignments, flexible assignments, temp assignments, and all of that is part of the rewiring puzzle that we've been talking about. Well, terrific. Those are great thoughts, Robin and Bill. Thank you both. So retire or rewire, there's a lot at stake, particularly for someone who feels there's more to give, enjoys the challenge of their existing or perhaps new profession. Individuals who are 10 or fewer years away from their mental retirement date would best be prepared to address both decision options. So think of your life and career this way. As an analogy, you're in a stadium and all your family and friends are in the stands all cheering for you. What will the plays look like when you carry the ball toward the end zone and in the end zone? What new plays will you create when you decide to give up the position you were involved with for so long? So thank you for joining us on this presentation. And if interested, our listeners are offered a free 15-minute consultation with either Rob or Bill. Their contact information is on the screen. And we want to thank, again, Rob Croner of CCI Consulting and Bill Love of RTD for sharing their thoughts, their insight, and expertise on this very timely topic. We look forward to having our listeners on our next presentation. Thank you. Thank you. My pleasure.